So how many of you like to rest? Me. Think about it. After a long, hard day's work, or a long season's work, or perhaps a whole career's work, or raising a family, you get to go to some nice tropical destination, feel that warm, slightly moist sea breeze blowing between your toes as you put them up on a lounge chair, enjoy a nice afternoon drink on the veranda, and care for absolutely nothing. Doesn't that sound wonderful? It does. And our desire for rest is part of our DNA. After all, it's all over the pages of Scripture. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested. And if we are made in God's own image and likeness, we too are geared to work hard for the sixth day and rest on the seventh. And a Sabbath rest remains open to God's faithful people, the writer of Hebrews tells us. So it's all over the place. We're built for this. But, when Jesus says, my peace I leave with you, my own peace I give to you, but I do not give as the world gives, I think he's throwing a slight monkey wrench in our desire for rest. Because we run into trouble when we try to find the rest too complete and too soon. Think about all the controversies that have littered the pages of our news just this week. I mean, the underlying problem, yeah, I get people's urgent desire, especially people of faith's urgent desire to deal with it. There is undeniably too much violence and too much premature death in the world around us. But when we pursue our rest a little too hard and a little too fast, we wind up in the weeds. Bills that simply criminalize abortion or decriminalize it or abolish the death penalty or allow for it and do absolutely nothing else, all they do is they transfer that violence and premature death from one place to another. But they've done nothing to reduce or eliminate it. It's kind of like telling the homeless to get up and move on and thinking you've solved the problem of homelessness. It doesn't work that way, folks. So, Apparently, even though that desire for rest, that desire for completion, that desire to look at the problem, to look at the challenge, to get the job done, and then sit on that deck with the beach breeze teasing our nostrils, is right there in our DNA. Apparently, we need to maybe temper it a little bit slow things down and realize that we're in it for a marathon and not a sprint. When we see those things that need to be done, those things that our hearts are crying to improve, absolutely God calls us in that, right into the fray, right into the place of saying, whatever it is you desire to do, do it. This is from me. But also realize that the heavy lifting isn't going to be done any time soon. So how do we hold these two things together? How do we hold together this innate, insatiable desire for rest, one that I believe points us toward eternal rest, with the fact that the world right in front of us asks so much of us and seems to ask it constantly and endlessly, and in fact, when we lose our patience with that, that's when we begin making decisions that arguably do more harm than good. How do we hold those two things together? We hold them together in the promise that we heard in today's gospel, the promise around which our worship is centered for this particular season of the year. I will send you the advocate, the Holy Spirit,
Spirit. The word spirit, if you look at its etymological roots, means breath. It's even in our language. Respiration. Respirare. To breathe again. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. And in that definition of the Holy Spirit, perhaps we find the solution to the conundrum I just raised. In the type of yoga that my wife teaches and practices and that I often take, it's a 105 degree room held at 40% humidity. And for 54 minutes, you're doing a standing series of postures where you're never invited to sit or lie down. And the break between the postures is only a few seconds each. The reaction in the mind of, this is humanly impossible. You have got to give me a break. I need to rest. Sometimes even an angry feeling of, I need to rest comes up whether you're a beginner or a 10 or 20 or 50 year practitioner. It never, ever goes away for good. But the good instructor will always tell you the same thing every time. They will say, take one long, slow breath. Don't do anything else. Don't think anything else. Just breathe. And the miracle is it works. One long, slow breath. You don't even need to talk about it theologically. Biomedically, it resets your system to a degree that you would never expect. And somehow, amazingly, you're able to do this humanly impossible thing, not only again, but soon again. The Holy Spirit, the breath of God, is like that. When you think, I'm tired. I want to have this problem solved. I want to be done with it. I want to be able to walk away. I want to pass that law on it that fixes this once and for all, and then not have to keep thinking about it and working on it and praying for it. Stop. Take one deep breath. And realize that breath is not just nitrogen and oxygen and trace gases. That may be what it is physically, but mystically, it is the very breath of God. Train your mind to stop thinking all else and simply allow the Spirit in. And see what happens. I swear it will feel as if you have had your Sabbath rest and you're ready to get up, no matter how old and tired you may feel, and give it a go. That is the life to which God calls us in this mortal body. Yes, your desire to have it all solved and to rest, it's there for a reason, and I believe God intends to satisfy that desire more fully than you can possibly imagine one day. But that day is probably not today. So today, trust in the promise of the Spirit of God that you can literally imbibe into your body through one long, slow,